um, but also, oh, okay, uh, but also um, just to share with you that um, I'm also the founder of Cardiff Sixth Form College, uh, which in 2019 was ranked second. Uh, I set up um, I set up Cardiff Sixth Form College in 2008. Uh, it, top the league table in 2010. It then remained its position for a number of years until I joined OIC in 2017, and then OIC topped the league table in 2019. Um, I'm very proud uh, to, to say that this is the first time in the history of British education that a school has not only, well, a sixth form college has not only topped the league table, but had um, uh, maintained that position for quite a long time. Uh, and and, um, and this, as I said, this never happened before in the history of British education in terms of league table um, positions. So both of my schools have been um, sort of the top. And it's been great that even throughout the pandemic period as well, the last two years, uh, we've maintained that position. Um, so, um, OK, sorry, I'm just trying to get my... Is the okay? So that's in terms of the college. A little bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm the chief education officer at OIC since 2017. I I teach chemistry and biology, so that's my sort of background. In 2011, I won the best science tutor of the year award. I was also uh, the Welsh Women of the Year award for education in 2015, and I won the Class Nobel Educator of Distinction award. And I did a TEDx talk in 2016 about education reforms. Um, I consider myself as an academic strategist. What that that means is that my team and I, we help students uh, with both academic planning as well as um, university uh, planning as well, so career planning, so both the academic and the career planning goes hand in hand, uh, and I put a lot of effort, my team and I put a lot of effort in terms of the career planning aspect because academic is a is one aspect of their application but having a really good strategical career planning really does help with students university destination as a and as a byproduct they also achieve fantastic results as well uh, so I work very closely with top universities worldwide, um, uh, um, and I'm also an interview, a panelist on uh, uh, a few of the universities' interview panels, uh, and we work very closely with uh, the G5 universities in the UK uh, and also the top universities worldwide, including the Ivy League universities in the US as well. Um, so that's just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm really, I take great pride in the university destination. Um, and this is just to share with you some of the things that we've done. Um, now, in terms of career planning, the way we would organize our kind of career distribution is normally through three career groups. So we have the healthcare and biological science, uh, the physical science and mathematics, social science, humanities, and commerce. The healthcare and biological science covers all the life sciences, and then the physical science and mathematics covers engineering, mathematics, computer science, uh, and social science, humanities, and commerce is a as a far diverse group because we, you have from economics uh, and all the variations of the economics uh, courses from PPE to economics and management to um, to politics and economics or philosophy and economics. There's just so many different variations of economics related courses uh, to linguistics or uh, psychology or to law. So that group has the largest variation um, but by placing students into these three career groups allows us, therefore, to have a concrete plan in terms of their uh, career planning when it comes to both their supercurricular activities, which I'll talk more about later, um, but also in terms of their uh, the prerequisite for getting into top universities, so things like admission tests and interview preparation and so on. Um, 
so that's the um, career groups that uh, we work on. But just to share with you some of the university destinations that we've had. So in 2019 and 2020, so in 2019, where uh, the last year when exams were taken, when standardized exams were taken, um, we've had 100% medical school success rate, 100% Russell Group universities. Uh, we had 75% of students achieving A star, AA or better, 60% of our students going to Cambridge Imperial. LSE UCL 25% success rate to Cambridge so success rate means the number of students who applied and the, the success rate of those students um, and in 2020 uh, which was the start of the uh, pandemic um, we had 50% success rate to Oxford 32% overall to Oxbridge 58% to G5 universities 63% um, to LSE uh, UCL success rate for non-medicine non-medical courses was 80 25%, uh, 24% for medicine and Imperial had 55% for non-medical degrees uh, and 14% for medicine. And the reason why there is a differentiation between non-medicine and medicine is purely because for a medical course, um, there is a government cap, a government quota of 7.5%. For all other courses, there is no government cap, but uh, there is a acceptance of the degree of level of um, uh, you know, uh, difficulty in entering. So, for example, in most courses um, at Oxbridge, uh, depending on, you know, for example, if you're looking at economics or law or engineering and so on, you are looking at less than 10% acceptance rate. There are some courses which has 50% acceptance rate, but uh, the, the courses that my students tend to want to do, uh, they, are te they tend to be less than 10% acceptance rate, whereas for medicine, there is a 7.5% cap. Um, so that's why there's a differentiation between that those success rate, um, just to do with the degree of level of difficulty. Um, now, the 2021 university destinations, uh, we've had 55% of uh, students achieving straight A stars in all subjects in A level. And uh, these are some of the university destinations that we've achieved in 2021. Now, I think it's important to specify that 2021 was actually uh, the start of the challenges of when it comes to university application as an effect as a domino effect from the pandemic. So it's just important to recognize that 2020 was the start of the pandemic and the changes that came from that 2020 actually affects students and uh, in terms of their application for the next four years, you know, four to five years. And I'll explain in a minute why that is the case. Um, but just, that just gives you an indication of um, where what the uh, university destination has been. Um, and to share with you a few more highlights of our students. So our healthcare and biological science students, um, as you can see the some of our students with their results, obviously we've we've achieved, um, uh, you know, a, a number of students who've had fantastic results, but these, the, these students have been highlighted purely maybe because they are photogenic. That's why they're on the slide, but we obviously have a lot more students who've done absolutely fantastically well. Um, uh, and uh, you can see, I think the reason why I want to show you this is you can see that all the students are on their own individual journey just by looking at the number of subjects they've taken. You know, you have students there with three subjects, three A-level subjects, and you have students there with five A-level subjects. You have students with EPQ, without EPQ. So it's really important to recognize that everyone's journey is very unique. Um, and it's very important to recognize that there is no one size fits all. And therefore, you know, you have a student with three subjects getting into Cambridge Medicine and you have a student with five subjects get or four subjects getting into Cambridge Medicine uh, or you have students with five subjects as well. So it's really important just to recognize that everyone um, is on their own journey. It's not one size fits all. Uh, and then the physical science and mathematics group. Again, um, uh, we have a lot of more students that have done fantastic, you know, uh, had fantastic university destinations. Uh, but just to highlight a few of them, and again, to just share with you the importance of recognizing the one size is not one size fits all. And you have a number of students with different um, number of number of subjects uh, and have got into these uh, top universities for um, various courses from computer science, 
science, to mathematics, to engineering, and so on. Um, and a few of them actually on this list are from Malaysia. So Zen Rong from Malaysia, um, and we have Peldon from Malaysia, Hemendra from Malaysia, um, and uh, yeah, Shazril from Malaysia. So quite a few of them. Actually, let me just have a look at here as well. Um, uh, Oliver from Singapore. Um, yeah, and that's that's the Malaysian students here. Um, and then we look at social science, humanities, and commerce. Tasha is from Malaysia. Um, um, Kelly from Malaysia, Amber from Malaysia, Avinash from Malaysia, Shreya from Malaysia, just to show you some of the students have been highlighted here. Um, again, you can see the number of, you know, people with different uh, students with different number of subjects, again, getting into similar uh, courses at these top universities. Also, it's important to recognize that we have highlighted some students who have achieved scholarships as well. So Pearl, for example, with Prince Philip scholarship, if we go back, to um, Zen, he had the Jardine Scholarship for chem Chemical Engineering. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to recognize the so Zizuan as well with Prince Philip Scholarship for Medicine. So there's a lot of emphasis uh, that we place as well for students to apply for scholarships. Um, uh, at university and they, they have to go through a quite a rigid process for scholarship application so it does require another set of uh, personal statement essays interviews so that really goes through uh, we have actually a document which lists around 20 to 30 different scholarships that students could apply to uh, for university purposes uh, but again that requires another set of process in addition to their university application Okay, so now that I've sort of introduced you to myself and the college um, and sort of shared with you our university destinations, as I said, we're very, very pleased with our um, um, sort of university destination is the thing that I take uh, great pride on just looking at our just overall admissions record, uh, over 400 students admitted into uh, G5 universities over the last 10 years, over 500 students admitted into medical school, we've had 100% success rate for medicine, 100% of students received offers to Russell Group Universities in the UK, and 100% success rate of students admitted into Ivy League universities. To you. So we take great pride, greater, greater pride than even the uh, league table position, uh, because the challenge is meeting this admissions requirement with less than 10% acceptance rate for majority of the courses that our students are applying. That is a feat itself, um, because we only have two years to prepare for, you know, for students for their whole application, uh, if they come for GCSEs, otherwise, when they come to us for a levels, we only have around 10 months to prepare students. So that's why that makes the, the achievement even more remarkable. Um, so looking back now in terms of what has happened, so now moving forward in terms of what the uh, post pandemic kind of challenges, but in order to understand the challenges, we have to also understand how do we get to this situation. So COVID-19 changed everything about university application. So let's look at what happened in 2020. So in 2020, so as I said, 2019 uh, was the last year when external standardized exams occurred and 2020 was when we had this infamous algorithm U-turn and in 2021 we have we we had the teacher assess grades um, and each one of these in 2020 and 2021 has a significant impact so in 2020 the algorithm was applied so that uh, the exam boards were able to manage the grade inflation but unfortunately the algorithm was so far out that that created a lot of protest um, and the government so the results were announced on the 13th of August the government did the U-turn on the 17th of August and what that U-turn meant was instead of the algorithms, they would ex they would allow the center assess grades to be the final results. And the problem with that is that most schools had overinflated the results because they knew that the algorithm would um, would have reduced their uh, the grade inflation. But uh, but then the government did the U-turn. Now, how does that impact the universities? Well, it's all down to statistics. So universities normally make more offers than places. So for example, if you had 100 seats, they will make times two or times three offers per place. Um, and the reason why they make more offers than, pl than places 
because you either don't, um, for example, you may not get the offer, you may not get the grades, or you may choose not to accept the offer. So they always make more offers than places. Um, uh, and but statistically, it's never sort of had any impact in terms of numbers because the, the, there's always a buffer. So even if let's say they made 200 offers for 100 seats, um, they might get to 120 or 140, and that's okay because they always have a buffer. Um, so in my my last 20 years of experience, I've never seen uh, a significant issue with the way they, they made the offers. Um, but obviously in 2020, with the algorithm, suddenly uh, overnight, the universities, because of the grade inflation, they had to accept all the students. So suddenly, you know, where you have 100 seats and you've made 200 offers, you now have another 100 students, which you weren't catering for. And that was the issue that universities faced uh, on the 17th of August, 2020. And and then moving on from there, in 2021, the uh, grade inflation was so high, uh, nearly 50% A star to A grades, uh, that that changed the behavior for the top universities because A, they've already met their quota of students for the next three, four years due to what happened in 2020, but B, um, they are extremely reserved uh, with, the, with the, um, the grade inflation. So because of that, they're actually making less offers than places. Of course, everything that I've said uh, as an issue, as a challenge, there's obviously solutions around that. And I'm just going to share with you our one of our student, Pearl, who I just mentioned, who got a, had a scholarship uh, to study law at Cambridge. Um, I'm just going to share with you what she said about how we dealt, even despite the these challenges, even the level of difficulty had increased uh, tenfold. Uh, we were still able to achieve those fantastic university destinations that I shared with you. So I'm just going to um, put this on so you can hear her from her perspective. I think especially with COVID, because everyone was really scared or like uncertain about what to do. Um, John and Yasmin and the rest of the team were very quick to, you know, read up on what the government was saying and, and any new guidelines and new changes in exams and, you know, community and stuff. And yeah, they were very uh, quick to respond and adapt. And I, mean, I really appreciate that because it gives you that certainty and it gives you that knowledge that, you know, you're in knowledgeable and trusted hands. So Pearl is absolutely an uh, amazing student um, and she went through that whole process um, and with the insight, as she said, with the insight that insights that we had, but also the foresights in terms of how we would manage these challenges were equally important. Um, now let's just go through in more detail about what actually you know what what were these um, issues here. So first of all, in um, 2019, the A star to A grades were 25.5 percent of all grades. In 2020, it was 38.5 percent of all grades, and in 2021, is 44.8 percent of all grades. So that's nearly 50 percent. Now, what this has meant that the behavior from the universities, especially the top universities, so I'm only talking about top universities here and medical schools because they have this government cap. Um, so because of the uh, changes, because of the great inflation, they have become a lot more conservative with the number of offers they offered. So for example, they also introduced things like oversubscription clauses. Cambridge introduced oversubscription clauses. Oxford University has made the lowest number of offers that they have in a decade. So all these things has an impact in the number of offers uh, that they were making uh, to students. So for example, um, um, one of the things that they were looking at was reducing the number of offers per place. Uh, in 2022, we are hoping that exams will, uh, will go ahead. Obviously we'll wait and see if there are any changes. As of now, uh, exam timetable has already been issued um, and exams are to occur in, um, in May, June. Um, uh, there is a difference this year, so the grade boundaries uh, will be set by exam boards to be a midway point between pre-COVID in 2019 and 2021's record results, so that they are fair to this year's cohort. Of course, next year then, they expect it to go back to what it was pre-COVID. Um, what they're trying to do is to bring back the pyramid uh, so that they would have the right percentage of A star to A grades. Uh, the A level 
top grades will likely reduce by around 10% of points and GCSE lower by four points. Uh, marking will still be a little bit more lenient than pre-COVID, uh, but it's not necessarily the marking, it's more that they will inform uh, teachers to concentrate on certain topics and those students will be tested on those topics. Um, and of course, they are looking at reforms as well in A-level, but that will have, that will take some time. But that's what's happening in 2022. That doesn't still give the universities the assurances that the students are fully prepared for their quite demanding courses at universities. And that's another reason why there's a shift in behavior in terms of the number of offers that they're, they're making. Um, now, what's happening with the university admissions process, for example, as I said earlier on, they are more conservative in terms of number of offers. So right now, as, as I'm speaking right now, my students, I have just submitted around 114 applications this uh, sept October for the early deadline. So the early deadline uh, is for Oxford, Cambridge, medicine, dentistry, veterinary. So 114 um, is significantly very high when you compare with the national averages around five, three to five students that apply for early deadline. Um, uh, and a majority of the students have already either received offers or interview invites and so on. And some students have already received four interview invites uh, for medicine. Uh, and we've, we're just going through all the Oxford and Cambridge interview. In fact, I would say that for, as a, for international students, um, we're actually uh, one of the top schools where we've had the most number of interview invites for um, the, the early deadlines. Um, so it's fantastic to see that despite the challenges, you know, the students are going through the right processes and the right strategy to give them the best chance to compete. Um, because now, as I said, they're making less offers, they've introduced oversubscription clauses. Um, so all these things need to be mitigated with really strong strategy. Um, there are obviously additional form of assessments, either through admission tests or the admission test that, that, that they've already subscribed to, they would increase weighting and importance. So for example, in medicine, you have BMAT and UCAT, there's additional emphasis and weighting on those admission tests compared to pre-pandemic. And where the universities did not subscribe to a particular admission test, they are now subscribing it. And even more and more Russell Group universities are subscribing it. So for example, TMUA, which is for mathematics, is now required by not just by Oxbridge or Imperial, but quite a number of Russell Group universities as well. Alnet, um, a few years ago, it was only for law, that was only required by eight universities, and now it's 25. So you can see a lot more universities subscribing. And in fact, not just UK universities are subscribing to admission tests, universities abroad are also subscribing to admission tests. You take the NTU in Singapore, subscribed to BMAT University, University of Malaya has subscribed to the BMAT uh, admission test. So you can see a lot more universities subscribing to the admission test. So admission test is key because it's standardized testing. And I can tell you now that this year's admission test was one of the most difficult admission tests. Uh, the, the level of difficulty has increased um, uh, for students and the weighting has increased as well. Uh, interview also is becoming very key and not just interview, but also a test at the time of interview is also becoming key. So for example, um, students are being given a test, a pre-interview test, uh, either the you know before the interview day or on the interview day, and then they go through the interview and the interview can be of uh, different formats. Um, and this is really to filter the top quality applicants applicant so that it's not just about the academic strengths, uh, which they cannot just assess through the qualification because of the pandemic inflation, uh, but also to assess their thinking skills. Now, bear in mind that these things were already tested pre-pandemic. Uh, so it's not like they're all new. So these uh, skills were all tested pre-pandemic. It's just that two things have changed. A, the weighting and the importance of these admission tests, but B, um, the level of difficulty. And I would say another one to see would be that more and more universities are subscribing to these admission tests as well. And we can see a lot more uh, moving forward uh, that would require this. Now, how do you prepare for these changes? So this is where we're gonna talk about the solutions here. So first of all, um, it's very important that don't wait 
for changes to happen. So regardless of what happens around us, for the students who are listening into this call this morning or this afternoon, your time, um, um, you have to remember that you need to start now, start preparing, do what's in your control. Everything else is not in your control. So forget about external control, you do what's in your control. And in your control is start preparing now, never wait for what the changes could be. And you can start preparing now with simple steps. Most important thing, remember, is strategy, strategy, strategy. Um, if you really want to get into top universities, if that's your goal, if you want to get into competitive courses, and that's what, you know, it's your goal, then it's really important to think like an academic athlete. Uh, because if you're in sports, you would be training, 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 because that's what sports requires of you. If you're going to play in a match, if you're going to go for a championship, if you're going to, you know, you have to train. It's the same thing, exactly the same when you're applying for top universities for competitive courses. Think of yourself as an academic athlete. Uh, so that requires a lot of strategy, coaching, a lot of um, uh, good preparation um, and uh, training around this basically that's it and, and build it up build it up don't just wait till the end and you have to do that alongside with your academic uh, learning as well so you have to build that in is what you would do if you were a sports person exactly the same so uh, the thing that you have to really work on is your supercurricular element, as I mentioned briefly earlier on, uh, and that's very different from extracurricular. So extracurricular are things that you do to hone your skill sets uh, and also to distress yourself, you know, so you have things that you enjoy. But supercurricular, wider reading, voluntary work, admission test preparation, interview preparation, thinking outside the box, learning skills like reasoning skills, um, that's really crucial. So start working on the supercurricular ASAP. Don't wait till you are our year 12, uh, whatever age you're in, uh, start now. I, I, I help students who are from year 10 preparing for the supercurricular um, elements. So very important to look at that. Um, and um, just going back to where we were here. Okay, so that's in terms of the COVID-19. Now let's look at what do you need to enter a top university? Um, so why, first of all, why go to a top university? So uh, so for the students who are listening to this, of course, your parents will say uh, you, they would want you to apply to a top university or aim for the top universities, but your parents will love you no matter what. So um, however, for the students who are listening, to this, I would say that uh, top universities is not about just the brand or having a great uh, job later on or whatsoever. It's really a lifestyle choice because you will be surrounded by like-minded individuals. You'll be taught by people who are really passionate about their subject. Um, you'll be given the platform to excel and have the opportunities that will come with that. So whether it's research opportunities, publication opportunities, work experience opportunities, all these things that you get from the platform. However, it does come with a lot of hard work. It is a lot, first of all, it's hard work to get into the university and then there's a lot of hard work to maintain yourself there as well. You're basically a small fish in a big pond. Um, but the key here is, do you want this lifestyle choice? Because if you do, then you gain so much out of it as an experience. Um, I myself went to, uh, uh, did natural science at Cambridge and it was a really different experience to, um, to, to just, you know, to, to just the normal learning processes. Uh, I remember my first day at university, I had to think about philosophy, even though I'm a science student. Um, I did, I'm from Malaysia, I did uh, SPM um, and uh, then came to the UK to do my A-levels and then went on to study natural sciences. Um, and it was a very different thing because my first lesson was on philosophy even though I'm a science student and I was thinking oh my god what am I doing here you know but uh, it was so exciting because you learn to really expose your thinking skills uh, to a very different level and that's very enjoyable um, so that's in, ter that's in terms of um, um, why, uh, you know, why would you want to go to top universities, but what do you need to enter a top university? So first of all, you need to obviously excel in your academic results in the right subjects. So whether you're doing GCSEs or AS, and it's important to do the right number of subjects, you have to show commitment to your subject, admission test results, 
personal statement interviews. All these things in the mix is equally important, but the two things I would say is more weighted because of the pandemic are the interviews and the admission test results. Personal statement shows your building blocks of your super curricula, and of course your commitment to your subject is demonstrated through all those mechanisms. Um, and uh, so just going to how universities would assess your application. So how, what, what happens there? Uh, first of all, as I said, the first thing they'll look at is your GCSEs or IGCSEs or equivalents. So those of you doing SPM or GCSEs or IGCSEs, they are extremely important because at the time when you apply, this will be your only achieved results. And the next achieved result will be your AS results, uh, provided you go to a school that does take AS level. Uh, so for example, at OIC, see we have AS exams and AS exams provides validation for your um, A level. So GCSE, IGCSEs or equivalent, very, very important. Do the right number of subjects, very important. Do it in one sitting um, and then choose the right subjects at A level. So for example, if you do business studies and economics at A level, you will be rejected uh, for economics degree. Uh, if you don't, you know, we all know chemistry and biology, chemistry especially is a must for medicine. Uh, but then if you don't do biology, you then uh, rule out at least half of the universities you can apply to because they do say that they want biology and the other universities say they want they prefer biology so it's very important to choose the right subjects um and then, of course, uh, at the time when you apply, you will have your predicted A level or IB grades. You will then have your personal statement, interview, admission test. So all those things are important. Now, irrelevant to UK universities are actually the extracurricular activities compared to the more super curricular activities. Um, and what that means is that if you have grade eight piano, fantastic, uh, but that doesn't tell us that you why you want to be a doctor. So if you have, uh, it's just basically like, imagine if you have an interest in playing football, you have to really demonstrate your passion about football and everything you know about football. It's almost like everything else you do outside that is just to give you a skill set, but you have to demonstrate your passion. Um, uh, so that's really important to understand understand that your great eight piano and what you do as extracurricular is important and is important to make you the person you are and they obviously want that but they also really want to know your passion in your subjects and that's you can only demonstrate that through things like wider reading uh, work experience um, projects competitions doing well in your admission test and showcasing it in your interview um, just to go back to this here. So what is the critical uh, um, path uh, to success? So this is the path to universities. So just to show you a little bit of timeline. So let's say you were to start your A-level in September, 2021, uh, you can change the year, it's fine. Um, uh, and then that will be your first year of your A-level. So your AS, your year 12 studies is in the first uh, row. And then you've got, so if you start in September, um, you then, uh, uh, you, you have your September 2021, you then go on to June 2022, sit your first year exam AS, you then have your summer holidays, uh, August 2022, and then you will have your results, your AS results in August 2022, you start your year 13 in September 2022, you then apply to university in October, you sit for it, most of your admission tests in November, some of them happen earlier, but most of your admission tests is in November, and then you go for your interviews in December, and then you start receiving um, decisions uh, from January to March, um, and then you sit your A-level exams in June, you get your results in August, and as long as you meet the conditions of your offer, if you have an offer, then you start universities in October, happy days. Uh, the most important thing here is to understand that if you when you apply in October even if you have straight A stars and you don't fit if you don't um, do well in your admission test students can get rejected at that point and if you don't do well in your interview you can get rejected after December uh, so it's you know having straight A stars in your GCSEs is brilliant but saying that you also need to do well uh, in your admission tests and interviews. In fact, one of the students I mentioned earlier on from Malaysia, Peldon, um, he um, he didn't do extremely well in, as in he wasn't a straight A star uh, student or he did his SPM, so he wasn't a straight A1 um, student uh, in his SPM or A plus student, um, but yet he did very well in his admission test and his interview and he had the offer from Cambridge to study computer science. So I have seen students, I have helped and seen students how they've 
progressed even with not the quite typical profile of a student in GCSEs, but yet did very well in their admission tests and the interview because things trigger at different times. Uh, and, and then went on to get offers to these top universities, which is significant because you could be a straight A stars in GCSEs, but don't do well in admission tests and then don't get your offers. Or you may not be a straight A star student in your GCSEs, but you do really well in these other aspects. Um, and then you get you know similar chances. Obviously, the best thing to do is always be consistent. Uh, but if you're if you whatever for whatever reason, if things don't go your plan and you still committed, then there's still things that you could do to turn it around. Um, so in terms of the critical path to success, because I'm a chemist and I love formulas, uh, university admission test uh, plus university interviews. So one plus two plus three gets you the offer. One plus two plus three plus four gets you into the university of your choice, uh, into your, uh, as long as you meet the conditions of your offer. So I repeat, one plus two plus three gets you the offer. Once you get the offer and you meet the conditions, plus four, you get to university. So that's really the critical path to success. That's the formula the ingredient. Uh, one and two, I would say equal weighting and the most important weighting. And then you've got your pre-offer matrix, uh, which is basically your academic results, uh, your teacher's reference, personal statement. Of course, if you don't have the results, that's the, that's the first thing that gets your foot in the door. If you don't get the results, then regardless of uh, everything else, you could get even rejected before you take the admission test. So the re academic results is obviously gets your foot in the door, but then because of the level of competition, you do need to excel in the admission test and the interview. And even if you are not a typical profile of a straight A star student, I mean, if you are decent, if you had decent GCSE grades, but you're not straight A stars, then if you do well in your admission test, you will still, you could still have that same chance of competing. Um, it's all about comparability. It's never absolute intelligence. It's all about comparability. How, com how are you compared to other students? So if, if students can be triggered at the right time and encouraged at the right time to excel, then they have better chance to compete. That's really the key to success. Um, so, um, Okay, so we've talked about how universities assess your application. We've talked about um, what do you need to enter a top university. Uh, let me just check if I have gone through um, all the bits here. Yeah, we've gone through that. So I am now going to talk about a little bit about OIC program. First of all, just to share with you about our strategic global pathways. So our students don't just apply to UK universities, they apply to US, um, um, Hong Kong, Singapore, the rest of the world, really. We have students applying to Canada, Australia, uh, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to Japan. We had a Malaysian student last year who had all her five offers, and then she chose to go to Japan because she had a full scholarship there. So we're very, we're very hot into scholarship applications as well. And when we do our career planning, we don't just focus on what's going to happen right now. We also focus on what happens after you graduate. So for example, when you choose your course, do you choose, for example, engineering, you can choose bachelor or master's. So do you go for master's degree? Do you go for a bachelor degree? So we very much look at planning beyond not just getting into university, but also perhaps looking at five-year plan. Obviously, plans do evolve, um, but it's very important at least to give them that advice, um, and then they can they can look at what are the options. So a lot of our students are applying to a number of universities, and each university have a, obviously their own nuances, but you also have similarities. So having that understanding, very important. All our students have their academic strategy tutor, and the academic strategy tutor help them through that uh, course of their application, and every application then is looked by me. So we have this, what we call as a production line, a team of people who are helping them with the different aspects of their application. And then it all comes together under the uh, guidance of their academic strategy tutor. And then it gets checked by me before it gets submitted to the university. So we work through a very efficient production line, um, which is really, which is why we have uh, these fantastic results of university destination, despite uh, all the uh, upheaval uh, of the, pa the pandemic uh, impact. Um, uh, so that's just to share with you the strategic global pathways there. Um, 
And we are also obviously um, we we run uh, A levels two year program and an eighteen months program a January intake and a September intake. And as I said earlier on, it's very important that we don't actually list our subjects on our website. And the reason why we don't list our subjects is because we really focus on the career planning to make sure that students have matched the right subjects. I'll give you an example. We have a student from Hong Kong who's currently studying Oriental Studies uh, who wants to apply for Oriental Studies at Oxford. He's just had his interview last week um, and he is doing classical civilization alongside with maths and economics. And he's the only student that's doing classical civilization because that is a subject that's, you know, that would help him with Oriental studies. It's a very unique course that he's taken. Um, so we have all these combinations uh, all the time, and it's very important to have the right subjects uh, for what you want to pursue. As I said, you know, if you take business studies and economics, students will be uh, rejected on that basis. So uh, also you have to choose based on strategy. You know, if you have three heavy subject, if you want to take a fourth one, then what subject would that be? You know, it's sometimes you should you have to limit the the the, the choices so that you can focus because it's not all about just um, having an enjoyment of your subject, but also to strategically get the best results because A levels is fundamentally, sixth form is fundamentally a stepping stone for university. So you want to be strategic about your choices as well. So choices of subject is very important to match with career. So we normally do a career counseling before students uh, come to the college. Um, and uh, we also offer the one year GCSE program where students do up to eight subjects. Um, and the reason why we offer up to eight subjects is to make their application competitive. Most schools on a one year program would only offer five to six subjects, but we do up to eight. Uh, because again, when you're applying to university, you do need a minimum of eight subjects to be competitive. Um, and then when you look at, uh, so that's in terms of what we offer um, at uh, OIC. Um, and just to share with you about how, what's our formula and our success, our pillar of excess, we have three branches, the academic excellence, the career preparation and personal development. From an academic excellence, um, as I mentioned, we had the best results when standardized testing, uh, the last time standardized testing occurred in 2019, but we also then maintained that position. I think we've just come on the best schools league table and we've topped the league table again this year um uh, but uh, more importantly, the reason why we get these fantastic results is because we have a fantastic team of teachers, all from uh, all from top universities themselves. Uh, majority are from Oxford universities, and and we have a few from Cambridge universities as well. Um, and also that you know that having that passionate team is very important. And then when you combine that with certain strategies, for example, we offer more hours per subject than other schools. And the reason why we do that is to make sure that students have more contact time. So instead of having prep time in the evening for their homework, we offer students more contact time so that they can be specialized help. Um, also, the third element or the third thing, the reason why we do fantastically well academically also is due to our tracking and monitoring of students uh, from their weekly assessments. So the weekly assessments allow us to be able to identify a lack of uh, revision, a lack of technique or lack of understanding. And based on this LOT, LOR, LOU, we are then able to provide the right academic intervention at the right time. And that makes a huge difference in terms of grade improvements. And we do grill them and during skits assessments and the reason is because we want them to learn on what they don't know and not just concentrate on what they know so yes uh, we obviously praise them praise our students when they do well in you know they achieve 80 percent for example but it's very important to identify why they've lost that 20 percent because if not then by the time they take the final exam these things are accumulating uh, the way we teach our approach of our educational pedagogical approach is really based on neuroscience, and that is based on active recall, uh, space repetition, retrieval learning. So active recall is the way we teach, space repetition and retrieval learning is based on how they do their assessments and the data tracking that goes with the assessment. So these are things that actually have already existed for a long time. So these are not new concepts that we've designed, it's just that we've done a lot better in utilizing this neuroscience cognitive approach. 
uh, in terms of teaching and learning. And normally we find that in the first term students struggle with, with, the, um, with, the, with the sort of the improvement that they need to make because there is a jump uh, that they have to make from A, from their previous curriculum or their previous school. But once they've made the jump by the second term, we normally see uh, a peak and we normally see a trajectory. By the time they do their Easter mocks and they do their final exam, we see a great trajectory. Um, and, and that proves that a student that comes in, we've had students who come in uh, getting C's and D's and then they end up getting A stars uh, in the end because of these trajectory uh, improvements that they, they do throughout the year. Um, so that's in terms of the academic excellence. Uh, in terms of career preparation, as I mentioned, the super curricular element is very important to us uh, because we uh, fundamentally are focusing on the career planning uh, and and um, the there are six strands to this: uh, the beyond the syllabus programs, awards and competitions, clubs and societies, further personal development, and then strand five and strand six is about the strategy to university. So we have these six strands. Please do look at our brochure for more details about these six strands. But really, these six strands are to ensure that our students go through all those supercurricular elements so that they have the right building blocks for their university application. And without these six strands, you will not have a competitive application. So this is extremely important. If I go back to this pillar, and if I had to choose one which has a greater weighting, I would say it's the career preparation more than the academic and personal. If I was to give a little bit more percentage, it would be the career preparation. Uh, in terms of personal development, of course, that is also equally important. Um, and uh, we have three types of clubs. Uh, we have the uh, fun clubs. So you have the glee club, the photography, the uh, uh, performing arts, and so on. And then you have skill sets club. So skill sets are things like debating, uh, computational thinking, and then you have the academic club, so the medical society or uh, a law club or engineering club. Um, so there are three different types of clubs, and majority of our clubs are student-led, and the reason why they are student-led is because we want to offer students the leadership opportunities to be able to be entrepreneurial and leadership when they take on these clubs. And it looks amazing on their UCAS application when they say this is the clubs that they have set up and led. Um, and of course, when they talk about about it in the interview as well so uh, we also offer mentoring coaching and i think that one thing that super curricular element that we do which is quite different from uh, other school is that in the evening instead of prep time we actually offer the coaching and mentoring so we have mentors in every field whatever the course student wants to do um, there is a mentor and a coach guiding them through the admission test the university application so alongside the academic strategy tutor they also have mentors that teach them and build those skills. Um, and I think that's that's really makes us unique in that sense. Um, so just to share with you very quickly in terms of some of the admission tests, uh, these are some of the list of admission tests that, and the list is not exhaustive, um, as you can see for the different courses. Um, and uh, this is an outcome example of admission test. So you can see that students who had above 70% are the ones that likely to get an offer. Uh, so especially for international students compared to home students. So please don't count the same when you read through materials on the website, don't count yourself the same as uh, home students is very different. So for MAT, which is a test for mathematics, mathematics and philosophy, mathematics and statistics, you really have to get above 70%. Um, and then there's some examples of admission tests. I'm just going to show you a few. Uh, if you look at a clock and the time is 9.45, what is the angle between the hour and the minute hands? Um, uh, so that's the answer there is D. Um, um, we, we can share you the presentation so you can have a look and see um, what these uh, questions are. I've just taken a few random questions from a few admission tests. As I said, there are lots of admission tests. The admission tests are mainly testing on five skills, verbal reasoning, problem solving, uh, essay writing, both in science and uh, humanities and advanced math and advanced science. So you have to have five skills. And if you ever change your mind from one course to another, it's important to have all those five skills. And we teach those five skills. It's timetabled in our curriculum to teach those five skills so that if students do change their mind. So for example, I had a girl last year who changed her mind from medicine to, um, to PPL, politics, philosophy, and linguistic. That's a massive, um, sorry, uh, psychology, philosophy, and linguistic. That's a massive change. Um, 
but because she learned those five skills, it doesn't matter what admission test she went on to do. So it's very important to learn those five skills. So again, this is just to give you another example. These are all the good news is that it shows you that these things can be taught and learned and coached um, and you can prepare for these tests. But at the same time, it shows you that it's not something you'll be learning in your textbook. So it does require that thinking skill element. Um, and this is just level one questions. The level of difficulty increases, of course. So that's just to um, show you the uh, admission test uh, examples. Um, I just wanted to share with you the uh, essay questions as well. So you have different types of uh, essay questions. So for admission tests, you have multiple choice questions, you have open ended questions, as well as essay questions. So that's basically what the admission test will be about. Um, and I'm just going to share with you uh, interview questions as well. Um, and this is a natural science interview question. So the questions are not uh, just about why you want to do natural science or why you want to do medicine is very subject spe uh, specific. It's about data interpretation, pictures. It's about abstract science question and also about your motivation as well. So for example, they could give you a graph and they say summarize the graph. What defines a mammal? What do the deviations of the line show? Can brain size relative to body size tell us anything about intelligence? Are they any flaws in the study? What body weight does the dog have? So all these things are not in your textbook. Uh, you're not learning that part of your curriculum, but you have to be able to use your skills and apply them to any sets of questions. Um, and the same thing for history, you could get a map and they say, what do you find interesting about it? When do you think the map was made? Where is it from? What is it showing? What message does it communicate? What does the name of the map suggest? How could this be relevant today? Again, this is not something in your history textbook. So just to give you that context in terms of how the interview and the admissions test really is testing higher order thinking skills. So it's really important to understand that. So I, I think that really brings home to the fact that, um, you know, in terms of uh, applying to top universities, yes, there are challenges and there will still be these challenges that will be a domino effect for the next three to four years. However, I think moving forward, there are also solutions that you can take into account to mitigate uh, the situation. And as long as you can mitigate those um, uh, situation, you can actually look at your strategy, your planning, you can have your academic and your career planning alongside. Uh, and as long as you start as early as possible and you go through the whole strategy and you go through the whole uh, process in bite size so that it doesn't stress you out at the time when you have to apply to university, um, the sooner you can begin this process, the better it is. So the takeaway from this is number one, there are challenges. Of course, there are challenges uh, for the reasons I've already mentioned. Number two, there's solution. What are the solution? Three things. Number one, start now, don't wait. Number two, look at the super curricular elements, build that alongside your academic and extracurricular. And number three, really look at strategies. The first thing is develop, understand your passion, make sure you affirm your career choice, affirm your course choice. Once you've affirmed that through exploration, through reading, through coaching. Then the second thing is to make sure you build evidence for your passion. And then the third thing is make sure you strategize of what you present to the university. So strategize your application. So that's basically the steps I would say to take away from today's um, session. I hope that's given you insight into what you need to do to get into top universities. Um, open for any questions, uh, Ronald. Hi, Yasmin. Yasmin, there's a question from Emberly in the chat box. Can you take a look, please? Um, yeah. Um. Right, Amberly. I just wanted to ask if leadership uh, commitments head student to be counted as supercurricular or extracurricular. Okay, so very good question, Amber. Um, so it depends on. So head student will be an extracurricular um, because you're showing leadership commitment. However, uh, if you can show, so for example, if you can talk about an activity that you have taken that can uh, that uh, has a relevance to your course, then that will become a supercurricular. 
So for example, Amber, what, what is it that you would like to do at university? Let, let's assume you want to do, um, I don't know, medicine, for example, right? So as a head student, um, you, one of the things that you would have to do uh, is obviously be approachable to your, to your fellow uh, mates. And uh, what that means is perhaps you have dealt with mental health issues or you have dealt with solving a problem, uh, a difficult situation, how did you negotiate that through? That then becomes a super curriculum. So it's never about just the one thing, it's about linking and reflecting. If you can link things together and then you can reflect upon that, that makes you a perf uh, the best candidate really. Uh, no, we, we, I have, I have, I'm on the interview panel, as I said, uh, as I said earlier on, uh, for most of the universities. Um, and uh, one of the things that they normally see is that students are bringing in lists of things that they've done. And while the list is important, uh, what's really crucial is how do you reflect upon what you've done and then link it to other activities and so on. So that's really crucial. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, Ashlyn, as a year 10 student, how do we start building a super curriculum? V very good question, year 10 student. I'm really glad you're on this call today, first of all. So well done for coming on the call uh, because normally when I see parents and students, they're already very close to their application cycle and it's a bit too late so great so what you need to do um ashling is uh, three things number one uh wider reading so have a read through lots of books related to different courses first of all identify areas of interest from the three career groups, whether it's to do with um, healthcare, biological sciences, or physical science and mathematics, or social commerce and humanities, pick out a career group that you want to go into. If you need help with that, contact Ronald. We have career clubs that you can take part in as a year 10 student. So, um, so you basically pick up first, eliminate the things that you really don't like, and then focus on a few areas of what you like. And then you start off with wider reading, and then you will move on to uh, projects and competition. And the third will be work experience. After going through all that process, you'll be able to identify what is it that you want to do. And during that period, you've also built evidence for your passion. But if you have any issues with that, do contact Ronald and we'll, we can set you up with career clubs. Um, Amber, if we have official cognitive tests like the CAT4 test, will they be useful as extra documents in the application? The CAT4 test is normally used for entry to schools like OIC, our admission requirement does include CAT4 tests and academic entrance tests with interview. Um, but CAT4 itself, a university application, no, because they have their own admission test testing the five skills I mentioned before. For. So that the, you would not be able to use your CAT4 test. Um, Priscilla, may I ask whether IGCSE first language English can be considered as a valid English assessment into UK universities? Good question. Um, it depends. If you're applying for medicine and you have not taken the oral section of IGCSE first language English, because the IGCSE English may not include oral, then no, you still need IELTS as well. Um, for other courses is less of an, uh, of an issue compared to medicine, but I would still say because English language is a minimum criteria, not a threshold criteria. There are two criteria, minimum and threshold. Minimum is what you see in the, uh, on, the uh, on the website, uh, on the prospectus. Threshold, you don't get to see it. Threshold means based on competition. So minimum requirement is English language and maths normally, um, and because it's a minimum requirement and you're applying as an international student, it is better to have IELTS as well. Um, and IELTS, you don't have to excel, you just have to meet the minimum requirement and other areas you have to excel. To get an economics degree in LSE, what are the subjects that I have to take in A-level? So economics at LSE is around 16% success rate, um, but they have huge volume of applications. Um, the subjects that you have to take at A-levels because economics degree, Ashling at LSE is, um, is very mathematical compared to the economics degree at Oxford or Cambridge. So Oxford and Cambridge is more quali quanti qualitative and LSE is more quantitative. So because of that, um, you have to have maths, uh, economics and preferred to have further maths and one more subject. So you have four um, and further maths will be crucial. Further maths is different from additional maths. Further maths is going to be as a preferred subject, even though it's not crucial because they cannot make it crucial because most state schools in the UK don't offer further maths. But for a private, for an international candidate, you do need to show uh, further maths. Um, uh, so there's a high level of mathematics component for at LSE for economics because they also teach econometrics as well. 
Um, so hopefully that's given you that uh, answer. Are there any other questions? Uh, uh, Sue Ann, uh, do to study medicine in the UK universities, is it necessary to take physics and A-levels? Uh, no, it is not necessary to take physics and A-levels. I have many students who don't have physics. They also get into medical school. Um, it really depends on what's your strength. If you have a natural affinity for physics, and you can get the best results in physics over other subjects, then it's better to go for physics. If you don't have a natural affinity in physics, don't do it because that it's not a great strategy. Um, so yeah, you have to choose really well. Now, bear in mind though, two things. Number one, your BMAT exam for medicine will have components of GCSE physics and a little bit more higher level of physics, not just GCSE, but a little bit more, less than A level, but higher than GCSE. So you will still need to read about physics for your BMAT exam, but it's, it's not necessarily that you have to take A-level physics because if you don't get the grades, then you've just shot yourself in the foot. Um, but um, uh, you don't have to have physics. If you are applying to Trinity College at Cambridge, uh, they do prefer physics. So just to bear in mind, if you're applying for that. So maybe you want to avoid that college. Uh, there are 30 colleges in Oxford and Cambridge. You don't have to apply. Uh, you can choose strategically. If we officially have Oxbridge app preparation as one of our school clubs, should we include that in our application or omit it? You should never include that. <laughs> you should never include you have uh, preparation because you're considered as a privileged student. Um, you're classed as a privileged candidate and privileged candidates, I'm afraid, in the UK are not seen with the same lens um, as socially disadvantaged students. So um, you should uh, not uh, include that. <laughs> um, do I need to take biology and chemistry in A-levels if, if I would like to have a psychology degree? No, you don't need biology and chemistry in your A-levels for psychology. You could have um, biology and uh, math is very important for psychology. Can you tell me why, Chloe? Do you know why math is important in psychology? Actually, don't worry. I won't ask. I won't test you. Um, it's because psychology has statistics um, and uh, statistics is uh, key, very key in psychology for research methods. So you do need to have math, uh, but you don't need biology and chemistry. Um, uh, may I ask if there are any scholarships or financial aid opportunities to pursue A-levels and OIC? Yes, uh, as I said, we're hot in uh, scholarships for university applications, so we'll equally be uh, doing so for A-level entry. Um, it is competitive. We are, as I said, you know, we're number one school in the UK. We get 400, app this year we had like 400 applications uh, for uh, entry to OIC for only um, 150 spaces or something like that. So we have more than 400 applications. So, um, so it is competitive, but I would really say to all everybody who's listening to this today, don't be put off in terms of or the level of competition is very hard. Just try, uh, you know, apply. You will be surprised that sometimes there's always something that sparks out. Like Peldon, when I met Peldon uh, years ago at um, uh, in Malaysia, I remember the first thing he said to me was, Miss Sawa, I'm not the best student. I've never been the best student, but I really think that I can be triggered and I can um, really be, you know, be pushed. And I really want to make this happen. Um, and lo and behold, I mean, he's now at Trinity College at Cambridge for computer science. Uh, so, you know, sometimes there's always something that will spark that will make a difference and change everything. It's all about being triggered at the right time. So, yes, we, we, we do have scholarship opportunities again Ronald will be able to help you through that application process in terms of the scholarship as well um, especially as a fellow Malaysian I think uh, as a school I want to make sure that um, um, you know Malaysian students are um, looked after and have the same opportunities that I had when I first when I came to the UK um, are there any other questions? I appreciate we've gone um, uh, above time and I'm really appreciate that everybody uh, has taken some really good questions and I'm very impressed with that year 10 student. Who's that year 10 student again? Uh, Ashlyn, is it? Is it Ashlyn? Really impressed. Well done for attending. Uh, Erisa, does taking single maths and A-level make us less competitive than students who take double maths maths and double maths when applying for UK universities. Uh, does take single maths and A-level make us less competitive than students who take 
double maths. There's no double maths. So I think you are referring to further maths. Um, so that really depends uh, on, so you have to understand additional maths is different from further maths. So let's just be clear. There's, I don't think there's an additional maths in A-level. There's further maths. At GCSE, you have additional maths. Uh, but let's assume you're talking about A-levels. So you're doing maths and further maths. Um, it really depends on the course. If you're applying for medicine, then that's a disadvantage for taking maths and further maths as your one of your four subjects, because that shows less depth, breadth of subjects. They will not accept it as a fourth subject. In fact, you're wasting your time for medicine if you're doing maths and further maths, chemistry and biology. But if you're applying for maths degree, engineering degree, physics degree, the physical sciences group, then yes. And if you're applying for pure economics, then yes, maths and further maths, um, uh, you really need to, to have that. If you don't have maths and further maths and you're saying, will it make you less competitive uh, and you've chosen a course that requires that, then of course, yes, you will be less competitive. Uh, but it really depends on the course. I don't know whether, um, Irisa, if you are looking at applying for something like um, uh, economics degree, uh, if, for example, your strategy is more the university than the course, if the university is more important than the course, then my advice to you would be to um, focus on other courses that will allow you to enter with without uh, uh, further maths, basically. Um, so, so Anne, due to the current pandemic, work experience in the hospital medical center are not available. Will UK University consider online courses related to healthcare in the personal statement? Yes, they will consider online courses. Um, our students in our college have been very fortunate. We have been able to organize uh, uh, and they have been able to get some uh, in-person work experience, uh, which is absolutely fantastic that they've been able to do that. Um, and we continue now that in the UK, everything has gone back to to, to normal. Of course, I understand you might have read the news about the Omicron uh, variant, uh, but even then it's not as, uh, it's not as, you know, as bad it was as it was last year. So um, the work experience placements are still going ahead and they've, you know, the students have had significant number of work experience placements already. But to answer your question, yes, they will, they will consider online courses as well. But be careful of what online courses you're talking about. So, for example, if you are doing um, the BSMS online course, the Brighton Sussex Medical School online course, that is not considered as a work experience. That's just a course you've taken. Um, it just depends on what work experience it is. And the, the, the and also remember, if you're applying to medical school in the UK, they really want to see NHS experiences as well. Um, uh, so because that that's what's going to give you the edge over other internet national students. So students at OIC are able to talk about the NHS experiences, which is really important uh, for when you apply to um, for when you apply to 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 universities, you know, because you they want to show they want to see that uh, comparison that's made. Um, as a follow up question is ad maths required for psychology? No, it's only maths, you only need to do statistics, well, maths that in, includes statistics. Um, um, that's Chloe. Um, is maths, history, English literature, economics a competitive application for law degree in Oxbridge? Um, uh, yes, it is. A maths, history, English literature, economics, yes. Uh, but for law, they will really look at your LMAT or the Cambridge Law Test and the interview is actually quite uh, prescriptive. So they will ask you questions on resolutions on contract and tort law and so on, which is quite complicated actually. So you have to be prepared for that. Should I take an additional EPQ? So uh, G5 universities do not make offers on EPQ, but EPQ is a great source of information uh, for your interview and it's in your control. So I would always recommend students to take EPQ, um, but it's not going to be part of your offer. So if you're if you're using that to exchange for one of your subject, that's that doesn't count. Um, but it is a great source for interview discussions. 
Um, right. Okay. So yes, yeah, somebody's saying we'll be wrapping up soon. Uh, oh, Ashwini, how does Oxbridge view students who take a gap year? Um, so for all courses, universities, Oxbridge, including love gap year. Gap year is very popular in the UK. Um, I would, my son is eight years old and unless he's applying for maths or computer science, which is the only two courses that um, uh, the universities do not, not just Oxbridge, but other universities do not like gap years all other courses, they they love it. They love gap year. So, you know, my son, when he goes, I'm gonna make him take a gap year because it's absolutely amazing to take a gap year. There's a whole thing that, all sorts of things you can do in your gap year. Um, uh, Adeline, please advise if 2021 major exams will be canceled. Uh, at the moment, no, at the moment, the exams will not, uh, are still going ahead. Um, it, this may change. It's it's in no one's control at the moment. But um, in terms of what we are doing to mitigate that situation, because we have the regular skits assessments, uh, that is going to allow us to be able to present a very strong case to the uh, to the exam board, as we've done for the last two years, and we still top the league table. Um, but uh, most importantly, our assessments have also been very much liked by the universities as well. So that's also an added advantage. Advantage, uh, in the event exams are cancelled. So we're prepared for both eventuality, basically. Um, so gap year not recommended if my daughter wants to do maths and statistics. No, it's not recommended for maths degree because they do not like any gaps when it comes to maths. Maths and computer science is the only thing. Computer science probably less. Engineering is fine, but computer science, because if you're doing computer science with maths, then there's a, there's a stronghold on maths uh, and you should not take a gap year. Okay, I think I have said that we're wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, you have been an absolutely amazing crowd to stay on for 17 more minutes. I, I feel very honored. And, uh, and uh, please, uh, so thank you that you were not, uh, I, uh, people call me encyclopedia when it comes to university application and I can go on and on and on all night. Um, but, and my son gets very bored of me when I keep talking about university uh, universities. Um, um, but uh, thank you so much. You've been an absolutely amazing uh, uh, audience um, and very, very good questions. And I'm so pleased that um, we've got younger uh, students on this group as well, on this call, which is absolutely amazing that you can start your preparation now. I'm always urging kids to start as soon as possible. Don't wait, start building blocks uh, right now. Um, and if you are interested in uh, applying to OIC, um, please do you know contact Ronald and find out more about application to OIC. We also do a lot of other things for external students, for example, university preparations. For those of you who are in year 13, 12 in your in schools in, in Malaysia, uh, you know, if you want any help with your university application, we have a whole range of um, consultancies and programs that we can help you with, including summer programs or programs throughout the year. We also run career club sessions for younger kids as well. So basically, uh, you know, we are a small college with, with, with around 300 students. Um, but uh, we have a lot of other activities and programs on offer for external students, not just necessary for students who apply to OIC um, uh, as well. So, you know, if you want to apply for OIC, by all means, uh, and if, if you're not, and if you're already in a school in Malaysia and you want other uh, form of um, uh, preparation or advice, then that's something we can offer as well. Uh, but do contact Ronald and talk to him about what we can do to help you. Uh, but most importantly, um, stay safe, of course, um, uh, with all this Omicron variant that's uh, that's just hit the world. Um, but more importantly, I would say, um, do, do, oh, Jeannie, th uh, thanks, Yasmin. My son took up the external course for UCAS and he did good. Fantastic, Jeannie. I think he, uh, was it Imperial for mathematics? Is that correct, Jeannie? Uh, yes, I remember. <laughs> Yes, okay, fantastic. Uh, well, I hope he's enjoying his course. Um, and uh, I hope he's doing well at university. I wish all of you all the best to the parents. Uh, there's a lot that you have to pick up to prepare your children. And I understand it's frustrating because sometimes the information is not clear or sometimes you don't know what's coming next. I understand the uncertainties um, and the effort that you have to put in for your for your children, not just uh, build, giving them the opportunities, but also picking up afterwards, um, you know, when things go both well or not. So, so I understand uh, the element, the, the amount of work you have to
have to put in for the students uh, who are listening in today. Uh, whatever the challenges are, those are not in your control. You do what's in your control. Be strategic, never give up, and you'll be fine. You know, my students have all got into, they've all got their interview invites and offers and so on thing. Um, they've all, you know, they all. Uh, preparing as an academic athlete. So as long as you think of yourself as an athlete, winning or losing doesn't matter. You just uh, be an athlete and you will be all good. So all the best, uh, everyone. Thank you very much. I hope that was okay. Uh, Ronald, Ashwini, thank you very much. Amber, goodbye. And Ashling, well done again. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. It's nice to see the sunrise at your end. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Thank question, you. Or if you want to apply to OIC, please drop me an email or you can WhatsApp me. And yep. Thank you for joining today. Um, Merry Christmas in advance and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye. Bye.